So good morning, everybody. Welcome to Sunday School. We're glad to have you today. Um, as we always do, we want to begin our Sunday School time just by going over quickly a few things on our prayer list this morning. Um, I don't really have any major updates, except for I specifically wanted to share about Keith Lockhart, who's number 30 on our uh, prayer list. And remember, that's Karen Townley's brother, and he's been dealing with a, uh, a cancer diagnosis for some time now and going through all kinds of treatments and things. But he had um, a PET scan earlier this week. And Karen uh, let me know yesterday that everything came back totally clear, no cancer is showing. And so they are tickled to death and of course, rejoicing and praising the Lord for that good news. So I just wanted to um, to pass it along to you. Um, we want to continue to remember all those that are on our list right now. We have a lot of people that are sick and a lot of people that are beginning to travel this week uh, for the holidays. Um, some people, you know, left yesterday when they got off work and uh, we'll be gone all this this coming week uh, leading up to Christmas. So uh, we want to pray for all those travelers and for those that are still dealing with uh, COVID sicknesses. I know there are a lot of those out there, even if it's not in our immediate congregation. We all have people um, outside of our circle that uh, I know we are touched by it right now. So um, just continue to to pray for all of those and all of those, of course, that are taking care of all of those, uh, all of our healthcare workers and first responders and uh, essential workers as well. Um so if I find out anything new uh, during the week, I will text it to you. But for right now, those are the only updates that I have. Um, if you didn't watch the service last week, um, Brother Todd tried to give us a little bit of an update on our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And then they sent out a, a, a text on the remind. I don't know if it, all you are, have privy to that. Um, if not, all you have to do is get in touch with Brian um, Wolf and just let him know that you'd like to be added to the list. And it's as simple as that. Um, but anyway, uh, we went over our goal and that is, awesome and I'm so excited about it. So now let's just pray that um, God will um, give the missionaries as they need and that they'll be able to use this money to further his kingdom and praises and, and glory be to his name for all of that. And thank you guys for giving sacrificially, especially during this crazy time that we're living in right now. Um, all right, so let's have a word of prayer and then we'll move right into our lesson. Dear God, we thank you for this day you've given us. We thank you for the warmth of our homes that we can be in as we um, study this lesson together. Dear God, it is really cool outside, and I know there's a lot of frost on the ground this morning, so we thank you for providing us with a shelter and a warmth to uh, just to be in your presence, uh, whether it's in person, dear God, or whether it's, it's over this uh, communication that you provided technology-wise for us, dear God. We, we thank you for um, just the opportunity for us to open your word and study together, and we I lift up some prayer requests to you before we get started studying together this morning, dear God. We praise you and we thank you for this great news that you've given to uh, Karen's family, dear God. I just pray, dear Lord, that you would continue to uh, help her brother and, and heal him as he's recovering from the treatments, dear God. This is such good news for their family and I know uh, gives them even another reason to celebrate uh, joy this Christmas season, dear God. And I pray for those on our list that are going through other situations, dear God, that are still awaiting their test or that um, have upcoming tests that haven't even arrived yet, but they know it's going to happen. And those that are going through treatments and those that are just struggling with regular sicknesses, dear God, that are out there. I know the flu is upon us and there are stomach bugs that are out there right now and uh, just making people feel terrible and um, I know that we have people that have been touched by COVID-19, so we just pray for them. And uh, dear Lord, I just uh, lift up the unspoken requests on our hearts. Dear God, I know that we all have those. And I pray for those that are just down and uh, just, um, you know, disheartened um, this Christmas season, dear God. I pray that you would just put people in their lives, dear God, if it can't be in person due to quarantine or whatever the reason that they're alone. I pray that uh, some some other way that someone would reach out and they would just feel your love and your presence um, right now, dear God, because this is the most wonderful time of the year because of what you've done for us. And we want everyone to be able to experience that, dear God, and, and just know the joy that we're going to talk about in today's lesson. Now, dear God, we give this time over to you and we just ask you to bless it and to use it to give us the strength that we need to take this message out into the lost and dying world that is before us. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. So this morning, I don't know if you can see me or not. I usually, you know, get up and get dressed and get ready before I'm going to record. But today I am, if I move down, you can see I'm actually still in my robe. Um, I have right here uh, a cup of coffee with me because the question for this morning is, what are the traditions that bring you joy at Christmas time? Now, for me, it doesn't have to be like a big family get together or the annual party or, you know, the, something that we do at work um, or the games that we play or the stories that we read. Um, it, it's something as simple as just 
you know, being in my warm and cozy pajamas. And today's a great day for that because it's been so cold this past week, um, you know, with a cup of coffee and sitting in front of my Christmas tree. And I was actually trying to find a way to record the lesson in front of my tree today. But, um, you know, I have people that work night shift and um, 12 hour shifts at my house and people are sleeping. And uh, my open area where the tree is, is very close to some of those bedrooms. And so I was just afraid that I would disturb those that were sleeping this morning. So, um, so I, I didn't do that. But next best thing, I'm sitting in a recliner in my bedroom and I have my coffee and coffee is huge to me. Um, not because I'm one of those people that just has to have it to survive in the morning, just because it makes me happy. It makes me feel good. I love a good warm cup of coffee. Sometimes if I'm having just a really or I've had a rough day at work, I'll just come in, cut the coffee pot on, make a pot of coffee and just sit down for a second and just close my eyes and like, you just smell the aroma and it just makes me feel happy. It makes me feel joyous. I love it. So um, this, this is a, a coffee cup that Angie and Calvin gave me last year. They gave me a set of them actually for Christmas. And I love it because if you see in contrast to this coffee cup, as opposed to this coffee cup, you'll see which one is really larger. And I never really fill it up to the brim. I'll, I will say that I always make a regular size cup in it, but I just love the way it feels in my hands. I love the way I can hold it. It just, it's so big. Um, and it, it's just become my favorite coffee cup. Uh, Brother Todd has one similar to this size, but his has horses on it from back when he and Taylor were really into horses together. And um, we got him uh, the set at Cracker Barrel. And it's 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 not as tall as this, but it's way bigger around than this and very deep. And um, same, by, same token, he makes a regular cup of coffee in it, but there's just something about holding it. Um, but next to that one, I love at Christmas time, I love to, uh, you know, to drink out of my Christmas coffee cup. So here's a, a set that Stacy Bearden gave to me one year for Christmas and I pull them out every year and I might be the only person that drinks out of them uh, sometimes because Todd, like I said, it, it fills it up to the brim um, in, in, for my Keurig and sometimes that gets on Todd's nerves with it being that full so he won't necessarily drink out of them but I have them sitting in my kitchen every year at Christmas and sometimes I leave them out beyond Christmas because sometimes every year, you know, Brother Todd challenges us to leave something out that will remind us of the Christmas story throughout the whole entire year and so one year I left my set of coffee cups out all year uh, just to remind me of that. Um, but anyway, it just makes me feel good to be able to sit, you know, and, in, in, I don't have a, well, I have a fireplace, but Brother Todd says it makes the house too hot, so we don't get to use it. Um, but just to sit in front of my fireplace, not lit, um, but with my Christmas tree on. And of course, you know, the thing I'm going to say next is going to be my Christmas music. Um, I love Christmas music. I mean, that is the thing that um, that really, really and truly brings joy to my heart and life more than anything else at Christmas time, aside from the story of what it really means itself in, in Christ's coming. Um, but, you know, uh, you, you, just from you guys knowing me, I mean, when October comes, I am constantly turning to Magic 96 in the mornings when I get in the car to go to work just to see if they're about to start it. Um, I can remember one year them actually starting it, you know really, really early, like a week before Halloween. And I remember all the callers calling in, you know, just like, what are y'all doing? You know, but it made me the happiest person in the world. I mean, I'm, I love the joy. And I was doing some research about Christmas music. And I actually found out this year that Sirius XM, if you have that, um, you know, a lot of the new cars have that on their, uh, their radio now. Um, but and it's available to you if you subscribe to it. But um, if you do happen to have it uh, this year in their package, they provided 17 holiday channels. And so the great thing about it is, um, you know, if you don't like what's on Magic 96 or uh, I was getting frustrated with Debbie DJC because I felt like we were well into December and they just weren't playing constant Christmas music. And I was like, what in the world is going on during the pandemic? We need this. It just makes people have joy, you know, uh, but they finally started playing it. And I'm, I'm a little bit happier now. But before then, I was just I was looking up stuff on, you know, serious, not while I was driving. But, you know, before I get in the car, what channel can I turn to? There's a Hallmark channel. Um, there's actually a Hanukkah channel. <laughs> which is so funny to me. Um, also, and there's a New Year's channel um, that they provided. So 17 channels that are playing continuous Christmas music, some of which began as far back as uh, October the 29th. So a couple of days before Halloween, um, you know, but why do we listen? Because it's joyous, you know, because it makes us smile. And, you know, not only just, you know, the coffee and the trees and the, and, you know, the songs, there's, you know, there's lights, there's choirs, there's carols, there's, you know, little kids dressed up acting out in the nativity story. I've gotten so tickled um, just watching our little preschoolers, um, you know, at, <laughs> at the preschool. It's just so funny. Um 
there was a, a couple that were playing with a manger scene the other day and one little girl, um, you know, she had the, uh, she had the angel and she also had baby Jesus out of the, um, out of the, the manger for some reason. I don't know why, but anyway, they're, they're both like flying around in the sky with her, you know, and one other little girl was like, uh, what are you doing? Baby Jesus doesn't fly. He's not an angel. And she was like, oh yes, he can. He's the son of God. Remember, you know, and, um, and it's just, it just makes my heart so joyful to see, um, you know, everybody just take all of this in. And, you know, now we've added to the mix, our ugly Christmas sweaters. And of course we can't forget the nonstop Hallmark Christmas movies that have been on, you know, since, um, Halloween. So many of us relish these traditions, you know, because they take us back um, to uh, to a, a, a simpler time, you know, whether it was your childhood or a special Christmas memory. Um, back to the days when we could get together and celebrate, you know, and have uh, big family get togethers. I mean, you know, it, it, it's just it's wonderful to to embrace that joy. You know, but a lot of times when Christmas is over, you know, we pack it all up, you know, when the when the music stops and, you know, they keep playing that commercial, you know, that, on um, you know, December 25th at midnight, you know, they will go back to the same music that you're used to, you know, the the easy listening or whatever it is that Magic 96 calls themselves. because quite frankly, I don't really listen to them that much throughout the rest of the year. Uh, I will flip the channels occasionally, but my main time that it stays on there is when they're playing continuous Christmas music, um, you know, so eventually you know, this stuff that we put around the season is going to end, you know, um, and so we can't have our joy tied to the fleeting things, you know, because they're temporary, you know, we, we can't pack up our joy with our decorations. It has to be something that that we should embrace year round, um, you know, even when life is hard. Uh, because it's a joy that is tied to Jesus. And that joy is a joy that is forever. It's not meant to be something that is just over when the clock strikes midnight, you know, on December 25th. So today we're looking at two passages to help us with this because we've been exploring our emotions and how we should respond with those emotional times, um, you know, in a spiritual way that brings glory to God that will point others to Jesus. And we've already talked about how to, uh, you know, to respond when we have griefful situations in our life and when we have fearful situations in our life. And this week's challenge is just for us to embrace joy. Now, who wouldn't want to do that? I mean, it's tough to talk about, um, you know, embracing Christ and, and showing him through times of grief and through times of fear. But how hard can it be to embrace joy? You know, um, we should be able to do that. And um, and so we're looking at two passages, one in Psalm, uh, the 95th Psalm, as a matter of fact. And then we're going to flip over and look just briefly at the Christmas story in Luke chapter two, verses four through 14. So as we turn to uh, the book of Psalms first, if you're following along at home, um, you know, there's no real concrete information about who wrote the book or this particular chapter in the book. I guess I should say, remember, we talked about how Psalms is a bunch of little books in one big book. So the book, Psalm 95, really has no author uh, that we know of that is listed. We know obviously somebody wrote it. Uh, we don't know the date or the time or the setting of this author's penmanship. Um, but it is... Um, especially the verses we're looking at in one through three and particularly one and two, it's a time that, that the psalmist wrote to suggest that the worshipers, um, you know, proceed and, uh, and get ready for worship as they enter the temple. So we're going to talk about that and we're going to see what that means to us in our joy. And then we're going to skip over to Luke two, four through 14, that just, you know, really is a recording of, of Christ's birth and its announcement to the shepherds and, um, how, you know, those that witnessed the, the announcement from the angels, how they responded so um, the point of today's lesson, uh, which both of these passages are going to just kind of uh, engulf together, says we can experience great joy because Jesus saves. So let's just get started by looking at verses one through three of the 95th chapter. It says, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song for the Lord is great the great king above all gods. So the first thing the lesson writer wants us to see this morning as we're looking at this passage is that we can experience joy because God is our salvation this morning. He is our salvation. Um, you know, we don't, like I, like I said, we don't know who wrote this song, but this unidentified poet begins with a wonderful invitation 
for us to come. That's the first word in the sentence there. It says, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout to the rock of our salvation. So really it, it, the, the term come there is not, uh, you know, if you want to, if you get up on time, if you feel like it, you know, I get so tired of people saying, I just wasn't feeling it. You know, we got a lot going on. Um, you know, it, it is, is written in the, uh, in the imperative or a command to come. So the psalmist is calling people to come and worship the Lord. It wasn't a suggestion. It was, you know, you have, you need to do this, come, you know, and let us sing for joy to the Lord. Uh, the poet also employs the, the and, and repeats the same thought um, when he writes the second line there as the first, he's just using different terms. The first time he says, come, let us sing. The second time he just says, let us shout aloud. And this time he's the first time he says to the Lord. Now he says to the rock of our salvation, which, uh, you know, just essentially repeats and reinforces the expression to let us sing for joy to the Lord. So that first verse is just a calling out for us to come, for us to do that, much like we would do with our call to worship on Sunday mornings, you know, but um, maybe I need to say that tomorrow, you know, or this morning before we worship, you know, say, you know, this is not a, if you feel like it, stand up and join us. This is a, a command to come and worship together. Um, in verse two, the psalmist continues his theme of joyful praise because of salvation that the Lord's provided. And, uh, and he does that by saying, you know, uh, let us come once again before him. This time he says, with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. So here he's specifically referring to worship at the temple in Jerusalem. Um, so it's set it, you know, in the time when he is giving this uh, as an illustration to what is expected of the worshiper as they come into the gates of the temple. Um, you know, and although the Lord's presence can't be limited to any specific location, not just to get to the gates of the temple or to the doors of Dogwood Grove Baptist Church or to the First United Methodist Church or to Brook Hills or you know, the Church of the Highlands or wherever it is that you may choose to worship. Um, he has chosen a definite place um, for his people to gather and worship, you know, and congregate. But also it's not just talking about when you come into the worship house. It's also talking about uh, in your house, uh, in the house of your heart, you know, because that's where Christ dwells, you know, and as he is in there, then we come before him and we worship him. It really just means uh, the word, uh, the words come before there. It's in the Greek and Hebrew. The interpretation really means to meet. So that means to meet the Lord wherever you might be, whether it is in the worship house or whether you're worshiping at home right now because of quarantine or because, you you know, of just you're not quarantined. You just feel like that, you know, you physically don't need to get out right now. It's not safe for you to do so. You can still meet the Lord wherever you are, you know, because he wants to meet us right where we are. We just have to, you know, to, to come into that invitation to say, yes, I will come in. And genuine worship involves meeting the Lord. Uh, to come before him really means face to face, uh, right, right in front of him. So um, first, the, the, the writer says for us to, you know, to participate. And then he says, if you don't know what that means, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, just uh, if you choose to, but to, to meet God face to face, wherever you are, to come before him. And then in verse three, he summarizes the reason for this praise that we come before him. And it's because he says that the Lord is what? The great God, the great king above all kings. So how is God capable of being this salvation for us? We said we experience this joy because God is this salvation. Well, I see it right here in this passage that we just read by the three ways that the psalmist summarizes God's character and his work. First, he calls him the rock of our salvation. You think about the rock, um, you know, being this big immovable object, you know, um, but it's also a reminder of when the Israelites were in the wilderness. Um, you know, remember they were all grumbling and complaining because they were thirsting for water and they're like, oh, we should have just been left in Egypt. Egypt, you brought us out here to die, you know, but at God's command, what happens? You know, Moses strikes the rock and then what happens? The water, it says, doesn't trickle out from the rock. What does it do? It gushes from the rock, you know, meaning that, you know, God is the rock himself and he is repeatedly, you know, gushing out his blessings over us, proving that he provides what we desperately need. Just like the Israelites desperately needed that water. He will gush forth the provision for our needs as well, because he is that rock of salvation. So he is capable of giving us this joy. 
Um, because he is our salvation. He is the great God. He's almighty. He's all knowing. There's nothing beyond his knowledge. There's nothing beyond his power. He is the great God, you know, who gives us salvation because he, what he sent Jesus, um, you know, and then when Jesus died on the cross, he's also the great God who did what, who raised Jesus, you know, from the dead. So he's our rock. He's the great God. And then the third characteristic there in this passage is that he is the great King, what a great King above all gods. Um, you know, there are no other gods that come close to the one true God, the sovereign Lord of our universe. And um, he reigns over everything. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, as the scripture tells us. And when we reflect on the goodness and the greatness of God, then we're compelled to thank him and to joyfully come before him with praises. Um, you know, joyful praise is something that we um, we can do with others in corporate worship. Or like I said, if you're at home this morning, for whatever reason, then do it in private, you know, do it in your car when you're driving, do it in your living room, um, you know, do it when you're, when you're by yourself, when you, when you feel like you're all alone, joyful praise is contagious. And we turn our attention to the events of Jesus birth. Now uh, we're going to skip out of the book of Psalm and we're going to go over into the new Testament to Luke chapter two. And now we're not only going to see that we can experience joy because God is our salvation, but we're going to see how that uh, as we keep reading that, um, that, that we experience this joy and we embrace this joy because Jesus is born to bring it to us. So God is the salvation. He is our salvation, but he provides Jesus to bring salvation to us. So let's skip over to Luke chapter two verses four through seven. And it says, so Joseph went also up from the town of Nazareth into Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house in the line of David. And he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. So second thing we see, like I said, we've already seen that, that, uh, you know, God is our salvation. Second thing we see from our passages today is that we embrace and we experience joy because Jesus was born to bring us the salvation that God is. So Jesus's birth uh, and this truth of that birth provides a reason for exuberant joy, in my opinion. Um, you know, just go back and kind of think about the story and how it all unfolds, uh, you know, because Caesar Augustus, you know, sent out this decree uh, in submission to that decree. Joseph and Mary, what? They journeyed to Bethlehem. Uh, the Roman government periodically would take these censuses that would establish, you know, um, official lists for taxation purposes for the population. And so the government would typically send people back to their ancestral homes. So here the Jews are being sent back to their ancestral home to register. So Mary and Joseph, you know, who are living in Nazareth at the town at the time, they have to travel back to Jerusalem. Who's that's the home uh, hometown of King David. And because that's where they trace their, you know, their lineage and their family line back to him. So, um, it's interesting to know that the city's name here generally originally was understood to mean the house of bread um, in the Hebrew language. So I just got to think, how appropriate is that? Or how cool is that, that the one who is the bread of life for us was born in the little, you know, sleepy town of Bethlehem, which was originally named the house of bread, you know, so the bread of life was born in the house of bread. I thought that was kind of cool. And while Joseph and Mary apparently traveled to Bethlehem in obedience to this Roman emperor's decree, their journey, you know, more importantly, fulfills the divine plan of, uh, of the king himself, of God himself, for his son's birth to occur in this house of bread in this town of Bethlehem. So we see that in verse four and moving on to verse five, we see, you know, that, that they had to go quite a ways. Um, you know, Joseph and Mary traveled anywhere from, uh, I'd say 85 to, to, to 90 miles to Bethlehem to register for these taxation purposes. And um, some people have said, you know, why did Mary even accompany Joseph? Women typically were not required to register. You know, women were kind of low on the totem pole back in the day. And uh, they so they typically didn't have to be a part of that. But um, even though Luke doesn't give us an immediate reason, we know the ultimate reason was that what God was bringing about the events to fulfill the prophecy that Jesus was going to be born. And so it was necessary for Mary to be there. And so she was. Um, but Luke describes Mary not only as pregnant in this passage, but also as being pleased 
pledged to be married to Joseph. Um, so don't misunderstand this. Uh, that doesn't mean that they weren't already married. The couple was obviously married. Remember, engagement and marriage was, was basically the same thing. There was a ceremony. It was a done deal. If you were engaged to somebody, you had to divorce them to get out of it. It was the real thing. The term marriage in that day really... Um, had more to do with the consummation of the relationship. Um, the engagement was just as good as being married. So yes, they're already married, even though it says pledged to be married here. Um, but the thing is, they've not physically consummated that marriage. And so um, it's important that it's listed this way, though, because this lets the listeners know, um, you know, as, as we're reading this passage, that, um, you know, that, that, it just kind of underscores the truth that Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit and he was born of a virgin because she hasn't been with Joseph or any other man. Uh, so it's important for us to think about the significance of those words right there, pledged to be married in verse five. And then moving on into verse six, we see that, um, you know, after they've traveled all this way, now the time has come, what, that, that she should deliver, you know, that the baby is to be born. And in verse seven, you know, in the fullness of God's time, that's exactly what happens. You know, it says that she gave birth to her firstborn son. Uh, and it's important for us to think about this too, firstborn. Uh, that informs us that Joseph and Mary probably had other children later by natural and not miraculous births uh, because he was the firstborn, meaning there had to be some that were going to come after him. Um, and Mary wrapped him in these cloths and uh, you know, Brother Todd uh, talked to us last week about what these cloths were, the long pieces of linen that were used in the ancient world to wrap not only um, babies, um, you know, but, you know, the, the animals and the sheep and especially animals that had broken limbs, uh, because what they would do is that they would swaddle the baby really tight or swaddle the animal really tight, especially if they had an injured limb, because what? They didn't want that to be, that that limb to be moving around. Um, and we swaddle our babies. Why? Because they're in that little, in the mother's womb, they're tight, they're wrapped up and they're you know, they're in, in that little sack inside of her. And, you know, when they come out and they're flailing all over the place, they're crying because they, they don't understand all this. It's crazy. So you comfort them, what? By swaddling them and holding them close. And after swaddling her newborn son, the scripture says that Mary placed him in that manger, which we know was just simply a feeding trough for the animals. And, um, and this is where she laid him. Because why? Because there was no guest room available. Luke emphasizes this here to let us know that it was a very humble birth. You know, in contrast to what we think that the Messiah should have experienced, especially, you know, in his hometown of David. Um, you know, it should have been so much more pomp and circumstance. But he was born in very humble circumstances, um, you know, with his actual birth. And um, so from the get-go, Jesus was excluded from the normal shelter that others enjoyed. Um, you know, so Luke accurately portrays the Son of God. Is coming as a humble servant, the king of heaven, you know, entering himself and submitting himself to the lowest conditions to be born to bring us that salvation. And because of that, we can be filled with this inexpressible and this glorious joy. You know, last week was the third Sunday of Advent when we, we celebrate joy, um, you know, and you know, the first song that we sang in the service last week was joy to the world. And we all know the words to this song, joy to the world. You know, the Lord has come, let earth receive her King, let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. Um, but the song that we chose to sing last week sang all that but it also piggybacked onto the chorus that i just love you know that that says you know to to sing a new song open up your heart let the world know let the music start come on sing out joy to the world everybody come from all around lift up your voice and make a joyful sound come on sing loud joy to the world you know we do have reason to celebrate we do have reason to have joy um, and it should be an inexpressible and a glorious joy according to first peter 1 8 that's exactly what that scripture tells us and you know, if you go back and you think about um, the, the book that was written, The Prince and the Pauper, if you're familiar with that story, remember Mark Twain told a story about a prince who met a poor boy and they both looked really much, very much alike. They had an uncanny resemblance to each other. And so what they decided to do was change places temporarily to see how the other half lived. And, and uh, I think it makes reference to it in your book, but it says this made for an amazing plot uh, in, uh, in the novel. Um, you know, but think about it like this. Jesus didn't come to earth out of curiosity. These boys changed places just to see how the other half lived. But Jesus didn't come to us, you know, to see how the other half lived. He came to earth to set purpose, you know, and, and to bring us salvation. So truly joy to the world. The Lord has come. Everybody should, you know, should take that joy. It says, you know, from miles around to lift up your voice, make a joyful sound. Come on, sing loud joy to the world. So we embrace and we experience joy because because 
you know, God is that salvation and Jesus was born to bring us that salvation to, to give us that joy, you know, that, that joy to the world. And in the last passage, you know, in closing now, we'll see that the birth of Jesus is the cause of that joy. So Jesus brought it to us so we can embrace it. And he is the cause for it. So let's continue with verses eight through 14. And it says, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flock at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I will bring you good news and I will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a savior has has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. So now in verses eight and nine, the scene shifts from the Messiah's humble birth to the birth announcement to the lowly shepherds. And at the time of Jesus' birth, you know, there's there's been all kinds of speculation as to when these shepherds were actually there, because typically the shepherds would be out in the open field, but sometime between March and November, yet we celebrate Christmas in December. But actually that date was decided centuries after the actual event, uh, when the shepherds were actually out in the field that night. But, you know, it's not unlikely that the shepherds could have been in the fields in December, because winters in Judea were typically very mild. So it doesn't really matter. Um, but it said they could have been out there because, you you know, maybe they were out there uh, raising their sheep for the Passover celebration that was going to take, you know, place a, a few months, um, you know, later in the season. But whatever the reason, you know, whether they were out there for to prepare for the Passover that was coming up or whether it was between March and November, it doesn't matter. It says suddenly an angel of the Lord stood in the shepherd's presence, you know, and remember we talked last week about what angels were. Remember, they are created beings. They are not like, you know, they are not God. You know, they are they are sent to simply be what his messenger to proclaim a message for us. And does God use them to protect us? Uh, absolutely. He does. He does. You know, even the scripture says, you know, that Jesus could have called what 10,000 angels to come and rescue him, you know, but he chose not to do that. So God uses those angels, you know, but they are not the source of of the protection and the provision. He is the source of all that. Um, they are simply, you know, created to relay the message to us. And however God chooses to bring messages is up to him. But in this particular passage, God gives them this task of announcing and celebrating the birth of Christ. And so the shepherds are immediately uh, reacting in terror because, you know, just imagine this sudden appearance, you know, that, that is accompanying the, the, you know, them with the Lord's glory, you know, it says what the glory of the Lord shone around them. Uh, you can imagine that of course they would be afraid. They would be terrified. Um, and observing their reaction in verses 10 through 12, the angel commands them to stop being afraid. Um, you know, why does the angel say that? You know, because this is great reason for rejoicing, not for great fear. Why? Because the angel says we're bringing good news. Um, first of all, it's news of great joy. Christian joy is a state of well-being and it's a delight that comes from knowing and from serving God. And then secondly, it's, it's a joyous good news uh, of the gospel that is to be experienced by all people. So salvation offers, uh, you know, a, a gift that is free to everyone who will trust in Christ. So the angel is summarizing this joyous good news and saying, you don't have any reason to be afraid because today the Savior, you know, has been born to you this very day in the town of David, um, you know, and he's not just the Savior but he is the Lord. He is the Messiah, you know, and if you're looking for a sign, if you want to say, tell me how to find him, well, here's your sign. You know, like Jeff Foxworthy would say, here's your sign. You're going to find him. He's going to be wrapped in these cloths and he's going to be lying in a manger. We just talked about the cloths in the passage earlier. And now remember what the manger was. It was actually what an animal feeding trough. Um, and we all have it, you know, made out of this pretty beautiful wood. And, um, you know, when we depict it today, but most likely, I know you've probably heard this before. Um, most mangers were made out of stone or some type of masonry work in the ancient world. Um, you know, so um, what, however it was, though, it, it was definitely clear. The animals knew that that was what they ate out of. That's what they came to feed from. And so once again, it just lets us know that, um, you know, that he had a very humble birth because he was laid in what the animals would eat out of. And so that was also going to be a, another sign for them, because how likely would it be that you would see a baby placed in a feeding trough? You know, um, so here's your sign, guys. And then in verse 13 through 14, it says not only is this one angel, you know, speaking to them, but now suddenly. 
suddenly there's this huge angelic choir that appears, um, you know, and the word suddenly, <laughs> you know, just says something of unexpected nature. You know, if you are um, suddenly surprised by something, you are just uh, out of this world. Last night I went into my garage to get something and um, it was funny because uh, Brother Todd was coming home from his shift and I he had already told me he was going to be late. So uh, because he had to uh, to uh, go make an arrest, and then he had to uh, come from the you know, the the county jail to back to Montevallo, and he had to do some paperwork, I think, to process some stuff. And so he's like, "I'm not really sure when I'm going to be home," um, you know, and. Allie and I had eaten a kind of a late lunch and he was like, uh, you know, if you don't, and, oh, and I had already done some stuff too. So the kitchen wasn't prepared to really make a meal last night because other stuff was going on. So he said, let's just grab something, you know, from Zappa pan and why don't you just order it and go get it and then, you know, bring it back home by the time, you know, you get it back. I'll probably be home. We can just eat together like that. Don't worry about dinner. And I was like, oh, that sounds great to me. Thank you so much. That'll help me tremendously. So, you know, we call in the order. I'm about to go get it. I go out and have my keys in my hand, my purse in my hand. I step out into my garage and I hit the lift button on my garage door. And when I do, of course, all the lights are out outside and my little garage, you know, light comes on. Um, but there's a man standing right behind my my uh, car and he is talking loudly. And of course it's Todd. He's already gotten home earlier than he had planned to. And, but I didn't know this in the dark. I just see a man and I screamed out. Like, I mean, like you would not believe, I mean, just like literally screamed out. Cause I'm at, you know, walking toward my car and just my little garage light is on. And then I noticed that there's a man there and I am just screaming. Out. Well, Todd turns around. He's like, what? It, what? Uh, you know, I'm sorry. I have to open the garage. I said, you didn't open the garage. I opened the garage. So apparently he's trying to use the code to get in at the same time I'm pushing you know, the buttons for the garage to raise. He thinks he's just raising the garage door to come inside, but I think I'm going to get the car. Now there's a man at the back of my car, um, you know, <laughs> who in the dark and Todd's got a dark uniform. I don't recognize as him. So he turns around and says something to me. Um, so it was a sudden, wow, you know, and that's how it was for the, you know, the angels appearing to the shepherds you know, that they are, they were just like unexpected, uh, you know, that this heavenly host is going to appear before them, but the angels, you know, they just begin praising God and, you know, and singing glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. A lot of uh, translations say what, and on earth, peace, goodwill to men. Um, so the good news that the angels proclaimed was the birth of the long awaited Messiah. And notice that Jesus was acknowledged even at his birth as savior and Lord. So such a joy filled promise of hope and salvation, you know, should not be contained. It, and, and it was not contained here in this scripture because, you know, we know that the shepherds left. This is not what we read today, but they, they run, um, you know, to see, you know, what the angel is talking about. So in closing, you know, today, what are some ways that we can share Christ in a way that reflects this good news of great joy? Um, you know, think about it like this. Um, you know, it's Christmas. Everybody is scrambling around, you know, trying to get their gift giving all taken out, uh, you know, and, and under control. We don't have it done yet. Um, and, you know, and I'm just reminded, I'm just thinking about Black Friday, um, you know, and I read something about Black Friday. So let me, uh, I'm just going to go back to it now. I took a picture of it because I thought it was kind of interesting. It says, remember when Black Friday sales were just on Friday? I bet everybody can remember back to that. I know I can, um, you know, and even in my adulthood years, I can remember when my kids were little that it was just on Friday, you know, and then the retailers, you know, they started opening up the stores a little bit earlier. So, you know, it would be like five o'clock we're opening on Good Friday, you know, 3 a.m. we're opening on Good Friday. And then they moved it to what the stores will open at midnight, you know, on Thanksgiving night. Um, and then they backed it up uh, even more as time goes forward, you know, uh, making it to not just be a, a, you know, a Black Friday sale that opened at midnight from Thanksgiving. Then they extended it to Thanksgiving and Black Friday became part of Black Friday. And then they dropped it to, um, you know, to weekly um, opportunities of Black Friday deals, you know, and this year, you know, with the pandemic and everything that's been going on, yeah, I mean, pretty much Black Friday has been happening the whole month of November. And you know what? Black Friday sales are still being advertised on the internet and on television right now. Um, you know, so it, it's crazy. But why do they do that? Of course, we say it's to capitalize on the holiday gift shopping. 
and it probably is for businesses, but think about gift giving, you know, it's a wonderful opportunity, you know, to show love. And so we get so excited, you know, about, about giving these gifts. And so everybody wants to experience, you know, the, 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 um, the excitement of the shopping, you know, because you're trying to pick out that perfect gift for, you know, for whoever that is. And I read, uh, an article about, uh, a man who was talking about, um, well, it, it was actually Chuck Swindoll. He was talking about gift giving. Um, and he said, you know, when people are giving gifts, gifts. Um, it, it's not always so much, you know, we want the person that's receiving the gift to be excited, but just think about the joy that it brings you to give the gift. And, um, and so it, it says that he kind of offers a challenge to us. He says, this year, when you're opening Christmas gifts, he said, don't watch whoever's opening the gift. It said, watch the person who gave the gift and then listen to what they say. He said, then you'll see and you'll hear more joy from the one giving the gift and the one who actually opened it. And he said he could relate to it because he said one year he gave his family members a picture frame that he had made himself from um, curly maple wood. And he said, you know, they may not have remembered it. And he said, for all I know, the frames may have, you know, gone into the family garage sale before the next year. He said, but I remember the fun that I had planning it, picking out the wood, spending a few hours each evening in the months leading up to Christmas, preparing the gift. And he said, the joy was in knowing why I was building the gift because I wanted to make someone else happy. You know, and just like it says in Acts 20, 35, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Well, think about that from God's perspective. You know, he didn't send Jesus to the earth in some serious, somber act. He did it with joy. He is the joyous giver, you know, of the gift, you know, and he gives the gift willingly to us and joyfully to us. And then he gave it out of love, you know, and I imagine he takes great pleasure in seeing us embrace the gift of joy that he has provided for us in Jesus. You know, just like we take great pleasure in seeing our children embrace the gift that we give them at Christmas time or at their birthday or when we do something for them that's unexpected you know, out of the ordinary, just a little happy or a surprise here and there, you know, and that's what God did for us in Jesus. At Christmas is a time of great joy and celebration, but it's important to remember the reason for that joy is based on not the holiday, you know, itself and the season, but on the eternal hope that we take from knowing that gift of salvation that God has provided for us in the joy of the season. So take your joy um, this morning, embrace it, experience it, you know, um, in your relationship with Christ. And then, you know, just like Christ is the giver of that joy to us, be the giver of that joy to someone else this season, you know. And um, if you missed last Sunday's worship service, go to YouTube and look it up. Um, the very first song out of the gate is that joy to the world that I was just talking about. Um, Timmy Hayes does a wonderful job on the uh, leading the solo part of it. And then you can just hear the congregation singing for joy, you know, open it up your heart and let the music start. Come on, sing out joy to the world. Embrace your joy this morning. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the joy that you provided for us in Christ. Your God is a joy like none other. And we thank you that we're reminded um, through this Christmas season of that joy, but forgive us that Sometimes we feel like we have to pack it up when it's over with and put it back in our Rubbermaid tubs until, you know, next November when we take it back out again or whenever it is everybody puts up their, you know, Christmas decorations for the first time. We remember the joy and excitement that we feel when we open those boxes each year, getting ready to prepare for Advent and the season of it. God, help us to take that every day. We have this joy in our hearts. Forgive us for not sharing it and, and letting other people understand that they can embrace it just like we embrace it, dear God. Um, help us to, to take it into a lost and dying world, especially this season when people are in such a need for your hope and your joy. We thank you for it. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. You guys have a great day. And we will wrap all this up again uh, next week. And the next, I think we have two more weeks of these emotions that we're going to be talking about. Um, but next week, we'll, we'll go in a different direction. We'll go away from joy. We'll move into anger. But don't worry about that right now. Just think about the joy that God's given us. Have a great week. See you then.